Alright guys, so this is going to be the first of the many series that we're going to have. Uh, the topic for our discussion today is gel electrophoresis. We call it gel because of uh, the aqueous gel that we use in our setup. Uh, electro is because of the electrical charges that we use, uh, our specimen, our particles that we, you know, are used to basically separate or identify uh, are electrically charged so that's where electro comes in for us this is uh, movement or mobility migration of uh, anything but for today it is about movement and mobility of electrical charges in an agro gel so our typical setup for gel electrophoresis would be something like this So this is what a setup typically looks like. You know, what you have on one hand is a positively charged plane and on the other is a negatively charged plane. And right away you know that if you place anything in here, a particle in here, that is, for example, say positively charged, you would expect it to move towards this direction. A negatively charged particle will move towards the opposite direction, right? So this is based on these plates that we have set up so our interest is in separating dna rna and similar molecules that are larger in size but they have a charged backbone which is sugar Yeah, we have a negatively charged sugar backbone uh, in our DNA and RNA fragments. So because of the oxygen that's there, uh, that's in there, in your negatively charged backbones. So what we do here is we break different DNA molecules or different um, RNA molecules, we break them into smaller fragments, we place them in our setup, and we allow them to move or migrate from one end to the other and we expect them to move based on their different sizes so that is how we are able to classify them uh, since we've already found out we've already said that these fragments are predominantly negatively charged so what that means is you would want your samples to be placed towards this end of the experiment so that these samples when placed in here are able to move towards the positively charged plate, right? So this is going to be our movement, uh, a direction of movement for our samples, okay? So the other thing is for any movement to occur, you need to have a medium for these to travel. And since we already said we're going to have agarose gel as our medium, and an agarose gel is pretty much like a sieve. So it has certain uh, pores and holes in it for, for for travel so if you had to visualize this you might want to visualize it something like this so it's a 3d agros gel if i draw it somewhat correctly so there are small pools small holes in between for it too for the for the fragments to travel through so Intuitively, you could you could tell that. Intuitively, you could tell that because those it depends on the size of those pores that these fragments travel. So you could construct your agarose gel whether you want it to be densely constructed. You could have an agarose gel which is uh, somewhat less dense. The impact that it would have would be that these samples may not be able to travel through a very dense agarose gel. So. Uh, the way to look at it is that larger fragments may have a hard time going through that agarose gel, traveling through that agarose gel, and smaller fragments would very simply, very easily travel through. And this is what we see as the result as well. If you let this experiment run for some time, you would see these fragments traveling certain distances. You know, so this is for the first sample, for the second sample probably it travels here you'd see different bands appearing 
on this. You'll be able to visualize this using uh, some light source, perhaps an, a UV light source to, to, to look at the results of this. And you'd see certain bands appearing, which correspond to different set of base pairs in the fragment. So a fragment having a base pair of say 5,000 may perhaps be here. For 10,000 may perhaps be around here. 15,000 may perhaps be around here. Uh, well, let me let me do that. Yeah. So uh, the distance that they travel is based on their size. That is what we just uh, concluded. That a larger fragment may not be able to travel much. So a larger a larger fragment of say 15,000 base pairs, you wouldn't expect it to be here. You wouldn't expect this to be 15,000 base pair fragment. You would probably expect it to be somewhere around here, a 15,000 base pair fragment. Whereas a 5,000, a smaller fragment, would be around here or here. So you would expect a smaller fragment to be traveling more as compared to a larger fragment. So the larger fragments would appear close to the wells, whereas the smaller fragments would appear close further from the wells, which contain our specimens. So what we've done today is we've concluded that the separation is basically how much distance the fragments in a sample travel and their distances is dependent on their size because of how the agarose gel was constructed and once these base pairs identify themselves based on their size how far we are able to compare them with a parent sample or another sample to see how much they match with each other and this is what we do in dna fingerprinting as well um, so based on that we are able to identify one sample from another sample or we could compare it with a standard which is typically called a dna ladder which contains many base pairs and from there on you could run a dna ladder in one of the wells and you could run your own sample in the other wells and you'll after some time you are able to compare how much your specimen has traveled or how many uh, base pair fragments have you got as compared to the dna ladder and from there on you could estimate what is uh, primarily in your sample so uh, that is what the basics of gel electrophoresis is more on this in your reading materials and your video uh, viewing material as well um, thank you for tuning in today goodbye